All right, so before we get into the podcast today, just um, a big shout out to a little Grom Ripper who I met last year for the first time, Lewin and Engelbrecht, under 12, just such a happy kid, and we lost him yesterday. And uh, just take a moment to appreciate life and how short it can be, and just sending big love to his family and to all his friends and to all the Ugu. Sir Fraternity, I'm sure, a sentiment shared by Robin and Colin from both SSA and WSL Africa, as well as the whole surf community of South Africa. Rip Llewellyn. It is the lockdown episode eight and a big show for you today because we have got the head of both surfing bodies in South Africa and Africa really in South Africa leading the surfing uh, legends on the continent of Africa. Joining us from Surfing South Africa, the amateur surfing body, uh, Surfing South Africa is Robin de Kock. Hello Robin. How's it going? And joining us from the World Surf League, WSL, the Africa office, uh, the general manager of Africa, Colin Fitch. Hi, Colin. Good. Hi, Captain. How are you doing, man? Yeah, good. Thank you. So, guys, obviously, it's been an interesting five to six weeks. There's been a lot going on. And um, surfers have pretty much been in the front line of the media in South Africa for the last, uh, well, last week, certainly. There's been a lot of to and fro online. And from my side, as someone who works in surfing, maybe has a clearer picture of what's going on, it seems that there's been some confusion as to what the two bodies actually are to start with. Um, I think some people expecting, for example, that Surfing South Africa is like a union for surfers and that uh, should carry thus the weight of all surfers in South Africa. But Robin, I think if you could give maybe just a good description of exactly what Surfing South Africa is and who they represent. Well, we're the national governing body, so we're recognized by the organizations that um, look after this, the whole of sport in South Africa, and SESCOC, and the Minister of Sport. So they're two different channels. The Ministry of Sport is the, are the, polit is the political side of the sport, and SESCOC is the group of, is made up of all the federations. And most of those federations are Olympic federations, but there are other, other federations that are non-Olympic. But it looks after all, every single sport in South Africa and uh, Surfing South Africa is part of that. So, you know, we, we are recognized as the national governing body. We're part of the International Surfing Association, which is recognized by the IOC. So we're recognized by SASPOC, which is our local version of the IOC. And, um, we, our job is to sort of develop the sport, so, which is why we start pretty early and work on development programs and work with young kids. Our sport is to try and encompass all of the communities around South Africa and make sure that we get everybody involved in the sport. Um, you know, obviously we, 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 we are run by our committee and by our constitution and by our elections. So we're not, a, we're not an organization that's run for, for profit. We're an NPO or an NGO. And um, there are, you know, districts that part of make up our body and provinces that make up our body. We also look after the disciplines that you guys all know, supping, longboarding, bodyboarding, kneeboarding, parasurfing, which is adaptive surfing. Um, who have I forgotten? Nobody else. Yeah. But we've got quite a lot of disciplines in our sport. And of course, surfing. And surfing is the only Olympic sport of all of those disciplines at the moment. Um, and as, as the, the, the national body, the, the professional surfers all fall under us as well, because if they want to represent South Africa at international events, um, that is international team events, like the World Games, World Juniors and so on, or the Olympics, they have to be part of Surfing South Africa. Um, I'm not going to talk about the World Surf League. I'll let Colin talk about that. He'll explain his position. While we only look after our registered members officially, I mean, the only people we can report on to, to national government and to SASCOC are our actual members, the people who join through the districts. We do have a social membership, though. So the clubs that are part of our organization 
we don't charge anybody. We don't charge a membership fee, in fact, for, for anybody at our organization. So we have a social definition and then the competitive definition. So to, to an extent, it is our job to represent recreational surfing as well. And because uh, if we don't represent recreational surfers, who's going to? Um, and so for the last couple of weeks, we've, the, the, the position that we've taken when, when sending our appeals to, to government to let surfing you know, be seen as an exercise um, and therefore allowed to allow individuals to participate in an exercise is to work on behalf of not just our members, but all um, of the surfers, recreational surfers, suppers, longboarders, kneeboarders, parasurfers, recreational surfers. And, then, and that's pretty much our strategy. All right. So the amateur slash pro body, which is official for, for, you know, the International Surfing Association and Olympics, as well as representing all of those other sports. Colin, you represent the World Surf League, uh, WSL, uh, which is a professional sports body that is an international company, essentially. Yeah, Kai, it's, it, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a business, it's a company. And uh, I look after the Africa region. So right from Morocco down to Cape Town is, is the, the, you know, in every country in between that we're trying to uh, uh, get events into is, is something that we look after, you know, and our, our number one is to, is to uh, uh, create or to decide the world champion. Uh, and that is done through the championship tour, the challenger series, and the, the the qualification series. So we've got quite a few. It it has been a, a tough couple of weeks for us, uh, uh, you know, trying to get everything on track. But uh, on the other side of it, it's also allowed us to kind of press a reset button on where we want to take the sport going forward. So. Uh, we definitely have some very bright people who head up our organization in Santa Monica, California. Uh, unfortunately, everybody, there's nobody in the offices at the moment. They're all working from home. But uh, we're still managing to achieve a lot of good things going forward. All right, great. So a lot of talk over the last while is, uh, you know, that... Uh, what is going to happen once we move out of lockdown? Obviously, for a lot of surfers in South Africa right now, the question is, is when are we going to be able to surf? Surfing South Africa this week did put forward a document to the, the national bodies to, to push for surfing to be included in the exercise groups. And I mean, we've seen a movement overseas, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, um, most of the states, even those areas that had initially stopped surfing, have all pretty much come back online saying, no beach, you're not allowed to be on the beach, but you can access the water for surfing, paddling, and all the other water recreational exercises. Robin, do you think this is something that is going to happen relatively soon, or do you think that we're still pretty much in the dark? Look, um, you know, our appeal to the National Command Centre was that, um, Surfing be, that all ocean sports be recognized as exercise. When we work, I did see there was one question that was sent in, why don't we work with other bodies? We work, we, we, you know, amongst all the federations in Sasquatch, we've decided to stay in our lane so that we don't, you know, cross over. Like, for example, golf is nothing really like surfing. Golf is done in golf clubs that are owned by golf clubs and it's a, a you know, usually members pay fees. Surfing is, you know, recreation and competitive. So, so what we've tried to put across to, to, to the, national, the National Command Center, alongside other sports such as canoeing and the, the major ocean sports, is that we are an exercise. We don't need the beach necessarily. We do need the beach as a conduit to the ocean where we practice our recreation and our exercise. And so our strategy and our tactic is to make sure that the understanding is that we do recognize the beaches are closed for mass gatherings and so on. But then for our sport, uh, you know, our, our, our journey to the ocean is via the beach or via some rocks or via a pier. And, um, you know, once in the ocean, we practice all the necessary social distancing. Um, you know, it's part of our sports culture, social distancing. And it's, um, you know, fantastic exercise, healthy exercise, good for the lungs. 
in our document that we sent them, which is six pages long and is available on our website for people to read, we speak about the benefits of ocean sports and specifically then drill down to surfing. We talk about the health aspects, we talk about our social cohesion, the fact that we work with disadvantaged communities and we have them involved in our sport as well, and that what's happening by not allowing us to exercise or not to recognize us as exercise is that's preventing a lot more than just a bunch of surfers going for a wave. It's, it's preventing all the programs that we run and all the people that we keep away from other areas of their life and get them involved in surfing from, from that to happen. We, 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 we're very um, we're optimistic that in the, we're not sure about lockdown three, we're hoping that, that um, you know, something's going to happen to, you know, allow some kind of activity exercise that might be um, opening up for surface. It's really hard to tell because you don't really get that much feedback um, because I think that, you know, in the scale of things, all sport is fairly, you know, what the government's having to deal with is fairly big and what sport is, is not regarded by them as all that important, sadly. Um, but it is, um, and um, our focus is on the exercise part of surfing. All right, so one of the things that's really sort of started to raise its head, and I mean, I've had a couple of uh, top surfers on the show. I obviously speak to a lot of the surfers uh, in my personal capacity as a mate and as someone who works in the studios. Colin, especially looking at the professional side of surfing, one of the big things, if we take the whole recreational thing aside, right now you've got a world title contender in Jordy Smith. You've got a new championship to a rookie who's lucky enough to be in Australia where he can surf. Most of our QS, our qualifying tour contingent are here in South Africa, unable to surf. You've got a world longboard champion stuck in Bay, unable to surf. This is effectively these guys' job. This is what they do. They are professional athletes. And speaking to Jack Robinson in Australia, you know, he was saying he has a letter from the government of Australia, from the sports body, saying he is a professional athlete and he is allowed to move cross-border if it is for the, you know, for training in order to keep his surfing where, where it needs to be. And right now, for example, I saw a post from Aidan Mason Camp, one of the top junior surfers out on the QS at the moment going, you know, like he's losing ground. He's losing ground to all the Aussies and Brazilians and Americans because he is unable to train and he has already for a month and a half. And how much longer is this going to go on? And it raises an interesting question because, if, again, if we take recreational surfing out, if we look at the professional athletes, and I know the, the Sunshine Tour, the golfers are working on something to get the golf up and running again. Uh, rugby has put in an application to play games behind closed doors at stadiums with no crowds. Is there anything happening behind the scenes to get your pro surfers, your coaches, um, photographers and videographers? I had Alan and Ian on the show and they can't work currently because it's not just the competitive side that they're missing out on. We're seeing content, which is so important these days. I mean, WSL are a huge content vehicle themselves right now with no contest surfing happening. Uh, our guys aren't even able to do that. They can't put content up, which will make their sponsors happy. So where do you think that's going to go, that side of things, outside of recreational surfing? Yeah, Kai, you know, we work very close with Robin and, and Surfing South Africa. So a lot of our uh, direction comes from them. So, you know, we, 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 we're all in the same boat together on this, you know, not only here, but in countries around the world. So as soon as we can, you know, get surfing back on as, as a, uh, uh, a sport and that we can, can, you know, get back into the water, I think there are a lot more happening, will happen. You know, the big challenges that we have at the moment is, is, is travel, you know, uh, Surfers who may not be able to do a lockdown in one country may not be in lockdown in another country. So I think it's, uh, you know, we've got uh, Pat O'Connell and Travis Logie who are heading up all of this up in, in, in San Clemente or in Hollywood where Travis stays. But uh, yeah, they, they are concerned and I'm, I'm pretty positive they are going to make sure that the, 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 the 
the, lev the playing fields are leveled before we actually get back into competitive surfing. And we don't know, in all honesty, we don't know where, when it's going to happen. You know, we, we, we keep getting an update from a weekly update, I call a town hall meeting with Eric Logan, who you might know, who's now the CEO of WSL International. So he's keeping up, us updated daily. He's, it's great. He's a surfer. He most probably wants to get into the water as much as me and you and everything else. So Eric's been doing a fantastic job uh, and, and really keeping us uh, uh, abreast of what's happening globally and what's going to be happening. You might have seen that we, the, the, the whole World Surf League is going to change the whole structures from 2021. So yeah, I'm hoping we're going to have some surfing in this year. You know, it's been, we've been very blessed over the last couple of years with the events that we have had here, you know, and uh, one, one thing which has been really great for us in South Africa is that they listen, uh, WSL International listen to us. They take us very seriously here in South Africa. You know, of course, you know, we've, we've produced 14 men's uh, surfers on the championship tour. You know, we've, we've run close on 500 events in South Africa since 1977. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, as soon as we can get events on board, uh, working very closely with uh, Accelerate Sports, who, who, who run the majority of our events. Uh, you know, they, we've got contingency plans in right up to November, you know, even going into December, if we need to, in, in order to, to run some of our professional local WSL events in, in Africa. Awesome. And I mean, Robin, looking from your guys' side, I mean, serve, serving South Africa, the junior champs generally are beginning of October. Uh, I know the Open Champs were, were scheduled for August. Is that something we could possibly look at having towards the end of the year? Or would you think it would be a rollover for South Africa to next year? Let me just take this back a couple of steps. Because you, you asked the question, you know, how, how, how is this all going to pan out for our specific group of professional sports people? And obviously for our Olympians as well. Yeah. You know, we've still got potential qualifications. Um, when we're going to do that, I have no idea. Because, you know, as long as the world is in lockdown and there are no flights, we're not going to be able to run the world surfing games that were scheduled this week to take place now. Should be on now in El Salvador. It isn't. That was a qualifying event, the last qualifying event to get our Olympians back. So I'm not sure, but, but to take a couple of steps back, there are no sports in South Africa that are currently um, playing sport. Um, all the sports are doing the same thing as we're doing. They're trying to get um, a strategy together that it will make us ready for when the, the lockdowns are lifted. Now, remember, the lockdowns in various countries are at different stages of lockdown. In New Zealand, for example, because it's easy to, to, to lock down an island, the first world country that's got six million people in it, and it's an island, and get through their lockdowns, and they've done really well. So they're all surfing. They could probably hold a few events there, but they would, nobody would be able to get. So you would really want to have an international event in New Zealand. The other problem at the moment is New Zealand is although they've gone through their lockdowns, they can't hold any competition. So there's no rugby taking place. There's no uh, cricket taking place. You've seen the protests. Women's team has just cancelled their tour. So, so these things are still in flux because... Well, New Zealand is opening up their lockdown. Australia is starting to open up their lockdown. Brazil is nowhere near opening up their lockdown. No one can surf in Brazil. They are in the same situation, those top professionals. And you know our world champion is a Brazilian. He can't practice. He can't do anything. They cannot surf in Brazil. There's no, there's a, it is a huge issue in Brazil in terms of their numbers of infections and deaths. So there's a problem there. And I mean, they, as you guys both know, our top professionals, some of our top professional surfers come from Brazil. So I think it's the, it's the stages of the lockdowns in the various, let's call them surfing countries. It is unfair on South African surfers because most, as you said, Kai, are, are here. Our QS guys are here. You know, even Geordie is, I think, still sitting in Johannesburg in quarantine with his wife waiting to get back to Cape Town. He'll have to drive to Cape Town with permission, with a permission letter, because he can't fly to Cape Town, because there are no flights. You know, then he's going to get to Cape Town, and, and, he, and as a professional, he can't 
do what he does. But then Siakalisi isn't doing what he does either. Um, and, and, and Ernie else is not playing golf. So our, our, our situation at the moment is in flux. But as Colin said, with Accelerate, we started working on a calendar a couple of months ago, you know, in the hope that something will be able to happen. It's a lot easier for surfing South Africa because we are focused more on local events. It's still going to be a challenge if we have an event to get people to, because if we have an event in East London, everyone's going to drive, have to drive there and get permission to drive there. And we're going to have to work out how we're going to run the event because there's going to have to be six feet between each judge and all this kind of stuff we have to work on still. How are we going to run a contest? You're a commentator, Kai. Where are you going to sit in a cubicle? Because we can't have you interacting as you normally would do. So all these things have to be worked out before we go, yeah, let's go. Contest, same as we always used to do. It's going to be a new normal for all of us. Um, but we have, as Colin said, worked on a program. I mean, at one stage, we did hope to be able to run the SA Champs in August. We wanted to start our first series of local events in August. And we even started thinking about some of the City Surf Series events. And, you know, we could go right through to December and January. We don't normally surf in December and January, but, you know, hey, we've lost so much time. Let's do that. But the trick will be over the stages that we get. First, we've got to lift this lockdown for surfing. We've got to make surfing regard, you know, recognized as an exercise, get people out there. Then at least Aiden, who you mentioned, Jordi, Bianca, Sarah. Oh, no, she's not here. She's in Australia. She's luckier. Um, Zoe, for example, they can go out and surf and they can start getting ready for what's coming. But, you know, it's nice to hear what Colin says is that maybe what is going to happen to make it fair for everybody, because fairness is also part of what sport should be, is that potentially it looks like the world to, uh, and the, the QS and things like that will only start in 2021. So that, that's, that's the way I see it. But there's no reason for you know, us here locally not to start holding a few events, working on some, you know, way to get our new normal of running events. You know, we've got to try somewhere. So the best thing to do is to try with our juniors and see what we do and see where we can get going. And so my hope is that, my hope is that we don't give up hope and say, well, nothing's coming. My hope is that um, come October, we, the, the prediction is that the peak of this infection around the country will be sort of September. And then it'll start, it'll start going down again. And hopefully we can then start thinking of having a few events, local events, even if they're local events. I mean, we could, you know, you guys run the retro, the rolling retro, and then it's a really successful contest. Everybody loves it. Maybe the way to get back into our surfing is to start running events like that and to start getting people um, used to the new way of how we're going to run our events. I, I don't know what that's going to be. I'll leave that to the technical guys to join. On our hatch and those guys, um, and Gerrit Freilink and all the new guys, but but we're going to have to come up with a new normal. So there's, I don't think there's any reason to give up hope. I think there's always, you know, opportunity. I don't know if you guys have seen. I'm talking too long now. I don't know if you guys have seen that the soccer guys um, in Germany are running their first soccer game. This um, yes, yeah. Bayern München and one of the others are playing soccer and. People are buying cutouts of themselves, which they're paying for, as if they were paying for a ticket for a soccer game. And these cutouts are going to be placed around the stadium. So it looks like there's a crowd there, and the guys who paid for the cutout will be able to say, at least I'm there. So something is starting to happen. And I think as you know, surfers, we should have that kind of hope as well. All right. Now, Colin, I mean, if we look at your new CEO and obviously his uh, media release over a week ago, this situation, the WSL were always looking to change up the tour a little bit. They've been trying a few different things over the last few years. The big message kind of coming out of WSL head office right now is that they do want to regionalize the early days of QS a bit more, which is kind of playing into our hands here in South Africa was we had already started the process with the city surf series and a couple of other 1000s and 15s. Um, also looking, you know, speaking with, with Travis and Jordy and um, a couple of others, Jack Robbo, the WSL events are webcast, your main viewership. I mean, there are contests like Pipeline and J-Bay where you do get a big 
sort of crowd on the beach for the championship tour, Gold Coast. But if we look at the, the dream tour, the championship tour, good waves, webcast, best surfers in the world competing, this is something that they could pull off. They could do the contest without crowds on the and beach. I'll just do Clark, and I'll butt in. Yeah. And so that, that is absolutely possible. Because if you run an event at a place like J Bay, you can judge it. All the judges can stay at home and do the judging from home. You yeah. have to be the big guy. So, you know, and we'll get back to surfing. You know, we'll, there'll be proper social distancing. You'll have your commentators commentating on what's happening. These kind of things will happen. We've got to think like that. It, it really is. It really is, you know, to get surfing back and to, as you say, use these magnificent stadiums that we've got all over the world, Tahiti, Fiji, South Africa, J Bay. It's quite easy to get judges judging from wherever they are, what, like what we're doing here. So, yeah, that's what is going to happen, I think. Colin? Yeah, Kai, yeah, for sure. You know, they, they really, you know, at this stage is, is the... You know, I um, in communication with Travis and Patna probably every second, third day. I also, you Francisco Spinola, who's our uh, uh, you know regional CEO for Europe, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So we 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 back and forth on ideas and that. I do think the possibility that the, the QS one thousands uh, for the remainder of the year could run. Uh, I don't expect that we're going to see a lot of guys traveling to it, not with, uh, you know, 32,500 rand uh, in, in prize money, you know, and, you know, and a thousand points. So whether Travis agrees or, or Pat agrees that those events will only be supported by locals, which is maybe the way in which to go for the, for the rest of the year is that, you know, we, uh, if, if happily we are, where we can uh, run the Triple Crown at the end of the year with the Challenger Tour events there, then that would be great. But, uh, you know, they will definitely come up with some ideas so we can run events. Uh, we're very, very, very lucky that the, the first event in Tagazoot, uh, Tagazoot Pro, uh, was, was run and it was a co-sanctioned event between uh, uh, Africa and, and Europe. So we, we already have a regional ratings for our men here in, in South Africa with Shane Sykes leading it. So, you know, if, if we only have one event uh, come the end of the year, we're still able to crown a champion. So it, it's not the end of the world for us, uh, you know, and it's, uh, I think with the plans that are going ahead with next year, uh, you know, it could, uh, and the way in which they're looking at it, it could springboard uh, or you know, springboard a lot of y uh, young guys straight from a QS 1000 scenario onto the challenger tour. You know, so guy, if he ends up in the top five or top 10, I, I don't know the numbers yet as how many regional surfers will qualify, but you could have a guy like Jose Forfner qualifying for the, uh, for the challenger series without having to go and do the 3000 and the 5000 around the world. Again, it'll, it'll, uh, the big thing which Travis and Pat are realize is that, you know, due to the situation we find ourselves in now, a lot of guys have lost sponsorship. So their ability to travel globally and to have the type of money that they may have had in the past is gone. So it's better to try and keep your surfers at home. Uh, Japan do it. They, they pay their surfers really to stay at home and surf their event opposed to going overseas, you know, because they get more publicity for their surfers in their country. So I see something very similar happening uh, with, uh, with WSL uh, going forward. All right. And then obviously, um, yeah, Robin. The, the, it's going to be, it's something we're going to have to, um, you know, as world surfing, not just um, WSL and ISA, but we're all going to have to think about is how we're going to travel. Because as you, as we all know, surfers are real travelers. I mean, of all the sports, we are um, probably the biggest travelers with the biggest bunch of equipment. Um, and, you know, airlines are going to be, you know, after 9-11, things change and things are going to change dramatically after this. So that's something that's going to, you know, maybe play along the lines with the, the WSL are thinking of it, but it's going to be a little bit more difficult to travel with a lot of baggage and 
lots of surfboards and travel around the world. So maybe using um, what Collins just explained might just get to a going, and then we see how we go as and hope for a vaccine. That's pretty much what we should be doing. Well, I think yes, that's that's everyone's hope right now. But uh, I agree. I think surfers are the biggest travelers and. Um, Let's hope with the, the lack of business over this last period that airlines are going to wake up to that fact and actually come to the party for surfers because uh, we've been paying some pretty exorbitant prices over the years. Lastly, gents, before we run out of time, um, I think it's safe to say, I mean, from an outside perspective, a lot of people maybe have seen Surfing South Africa and WSL Africa, n not at heads, but kind of never really as a, a joint organization. There's been talks of like trying to pull them in together over the years. Is it safe to say that through this whole process that's happening right now, and I mean, having both of you on the show with me today, that uh, it's brought the two organizations here in South Africa a little bit closer and that we're going to see a lot more sort of, uh, of the amateur and pro bodies working together moving forward? Well, from our side, from Surfing South Africa's side, we work, work very closely with the WSL. Probably in the world, the South African Federation and the local WSL organization are, are two of the closest working federations in the world. There are many international, I don't name them, but many international um, amateur federations that don't work at all with the world. Here we work particularly closely with pretty much every event, the City Surf Series, um, Accelerator, Surfing South Africa's marketing company um, and they work and the introduction to WSL was via us and they worked really hard to get that city surf series going. We work, as you might have noticed, that our logo is on, any, on every single WSL event that's held in South Africa and we recognize the role that WSL plays. We don't want to ever take over the WSL's role because that's not our job. Our job is to develop the sport, get the surfers to the level that they can help go on to become Jordi, Bianca, Matt McGillivray, Mikey February, and so on. Um, and, and I think the, the strategy that we've got is, as, a, as a partnership, we, we, we do refer to each other as partners, actually, surfing South Africa and WSL very often. We have different philosophies, so we don't always agree on everything, Kai, but, but um, you know, the philosophies that, that surfing South Africa have mainly on the development of the sport, bringing surfers through, you know, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds, um, and, you know, working on our judging programs and getting to the where they are. And, and um, you know, you work on all the programs, you work on the, uh, our events and on WSL events, so you see what we're doing and you see what they're doing. We don't, we have a very strong um, gentleman's agreement as well as a signed contract between each other that we won't step on each other's toes. Um, and, and that is why there's no under 18 division run by Surfing South Africa, because the agreement is that that's the pro junior division and it belongs to the, the world surf. Uh, and that's an agreement that we took and, and, and made the decision, um, you know, but, but there's always more, there's always more we can do. There's always changes we can make. Um, but we do work together. We meet a lot in, in the times, the old days, we used to meet often it accelerates offices and, and thrash things through as i said we don't always agree on everything but that's the that's a partnership i suppose hey colin what do you think oh, with, without a doubt uh, like i said Ro, robin's in my unfortunately he's not a, a a qualified psychiatrist but he he does give me a lot of advice from the time to time so we have a really good relationship together we no doubt speak most probably once sometimes even twice a week so you know, if I go back to the days when I got involved with the sport, Robin Robin was a guy who gave me my uh, first Western Province blazer. It, it, it has shrunk. Uh, it doesn't fit me that uh, well anymore. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's been a really from from my side working with Robin. I think over the last uh, four or five years, we've we've actually uh, formed a really good partnership and and worked very closely together on many, not just not only surfing but trying to help each other out where it comes to our social responsibility programs and 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 helping to try and fast track some of these kids to the program who would not normally have had the opportunity to go to a professional event so and and robin and myself managed that superbly uh so yes yeah we 
you know, uh, WSL International have literally taken the leaf out of our, our uh, a page out of our book in the way that we're working with uh, the federations. And it's not just here in, in South Africa, but, uh, you know, in, in Morocco, in uh, Senegal, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire. So we don't go to any country as, as going in. We're the WSL, we here arrive. We have a mandate that we have to work with the, the local federation. And really, it, 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 we, we proved to the rest of the world how well it can work. Well, that's awesome, gentlemen. So I'm going to end it there because we're going to run out of time. But I think uh, a lot of big questions answered about uh, the future of the sport in uh, South Africa. And I think that's a big one that it is a sport, both amateur and professional. And obviously, all of us are holding thumbs that um, our government are going to see the, the advantage and health benefits of allowing everyone back into the water under under certain rules and regulations, which I'm sure we're all willing to, to fold. And I'm sure the message from both Surfing South Africa and WSL is please to obey the law and to, to not put surfing in a bad light and that uh, we all can hopefully get in the water soon and as fast as possible start holding some local events, both junior and uh, open and masters, so that uh, we can start the ball rolling again. Yeah, Kai, just from my side as well, you know, it, 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 it's up to the surfers to act responsible, you know, make sure they're doing the right thing. Uh, you know, we are very, very marginalised, we're a very small sport, and we need them just to uh, obey the rule of law. You know, it, it's not going to help any of them should one of them get fined or, you know, have to pay an omission of guilt or things like this, because that will effectively put an end to any chances of him, you know, traveling overseas or surfing any, should he make the world tour and he's got a, 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 a stupid uh, a, a admission of guilt of surfing, uh, surfing during uh, lockdown, you know, it, it will effectively put an end to his uh, being able to travel overseas. So yeah, from definitely from WSL Africa and, and to our members is, is, is really, you know, and I thank him for, for the men that, the, the lot that have, done, you know, uh, complied with the law. Yeah, just let's uh, be very wary of that and uh, let's do the right thing. Awesome, guys. Uh, from my side, I think it's just got, to, just got to say, we do understand the frustration and the fact that you can't get into the water. And it's not like we're uncaring and we, you know, trying to be subservient or anything like that. We, we're trying to do the right thing the right way. And we are, we're really, really pushing hard for the surfers. To, you know, surf, the surfing is what we do. And we want to see surfing and surfers back in the water. And, and um, you know, as long as we can do it, and as long as we work hard, you know, to get it done, and we're putting our, um, making our voice heard at the highest level, that's that's a promise. All right. Well, thank you, you two gentlemen. It's been awesome having you on the show. Good to see both your faces again. I normally see both of you a lot during the year. It's been a while. And from myself, look forward to another great show next. It's going to be the SA Momentum Generation. Greg Emsley, Paul Canning and uh, a free surfer from the heyday of the rip curl at the Bister. So another great show coming your way. Gents, thanks so much for being on the show.